Welcome to a special episode of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry focusing on God's unconditional love and grace. The rest of this week, we'll be bringing you highlights from the 2018 Healing is Here conference held at Andrews Karras Bible College in Woodland Park, Colorado. God has already given you the power that you need to be healed. You don't need God to give you something more. And now, here's Andrew. This week, we're going to be going to our Healing is Here conference that we did back in August of 2018, and we're going to be playing some of these programs. It'll be a little bit different than my normal program where I'm just sitting here teaching, but it was really powerful. We saw over a thousand people heal. We probably had 1,700 people that came to this conference, and it was really powerful. So watch this, open up your heart, and expect to receive from God. Praise God. I woke up early this morning and uh, decided I watched my program. And man, it was awesome. It was awesome. And I was teaching on getting angry and violent. And that's what they've been talking about today. And Carly, I think if uh, she could have got her hands on the devil, he would have hurt. So I just want to, and the Lord woke me up and uh, told me that, you know, most of you weren't able to see the television program today because you were here. So I'm going to share with you those same things about uh, getting angry at the devil. Look at this over in Matthew chapter 11. And, you know, this is a real simple thing. Uh, Daniel and Carly said that a number of times today that, you know, we complicate things, make it too hard. And some of you will think that, you know, it's got to be harder than this, but it's really not. In Matthew chapter 11, I wish they had time to go through the whole thing, but this is where John the Baptist began to doubt that Jesus was truly the Messiah because of the circumstances that he was in. You know, if John the Baptist, who is the greatest man that had ever lived up until that point, if he could doubt, then anybody can doubt. And I tell you, it was because his eyes were on his circumstances. He believed that Jesus was going to bring in the kingdom, the physical kingdom right then. That was a typical way that most people thought. And, you know, hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you are believing for the wrong thing, if you get your hopes up in the wrong thing and don't see it come to pass, it can be really discouraging. So he actually began to doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. And yet he's the one that God gave all of these signs to, that upon whom you see the Holy Spirit descending and remaining upon him. This will be the right one. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. At one time, he was so confident that when the scribes and the Pharisees tried to get him jealous of Jesus and said, don't you know that Jesus is baptizing more disciples than you baptized? He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. He sent two of his disciples, Peter and Andrew, after Jesus and told them to go follow him. He at one time was absolutely certain and yet because of negative circumstances, being in prison and um, other things, he, he began to doubt. And so he sent his disciples. I wish I had time to teach on all of that. It is awesome. <laughs> it is really good. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture because he was wanting Jesus to do something special. And Jesus said, just go tell him what you've seen and heard. And you know, most of us to think, well, if, well, man, I'm nearly teaching on that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Let me read verse 11. I'm going to skip these other verses or I'll preach on them. It says in verse 11, verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John the Baptist was greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than Elisha, greater than David, greater than Jeremiah, Isaiah, anybody you want to mention. He said among those who had been born of women, which was just about everybody, <laughs> there had never been a greater than John the Baptist. Nevertheless, he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Did you know every one of us, if you have been born again, you are now in the kingdom of heaven. And according to Jesus' own statement, the least born again person is greater than the greatest person before 
we could be born again under the old covenant. If you are the weakest, puniest person in this entire auditorium, you have more power, more authority, more victory than what John the Baptist had. You have no excuse. The problem isn't that God hasn't equipped us. The problem is that we don't know what we've had. And I think Carly mentioned this, uh, Philemon 1, 6, that the communication of your faith becomes effectual by acknowledging the good things that are in you. God has made every one of us a world overcomer. He has equipped every single person in here to do all kinds of things. We're focusing on the healing, but he has already given you the power that you need to be healed. You don't need God to give you something more. If you came here thinking, well, I've done everything I know and I just don't have any power, but I believe that you guys, if you will pray for me, you know what? You are denying this supernatural power. If you are the weakest, puniest saint in the body of Christ, you're greater than John the Baptist and you are well able to receive from God. That'd be a good place for somebody to say amen. Amen. Man, that is awesome. And then he says in the next verse, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. You know, I used to struggle to understand this. What does this mean? And I'm sure that there's probably more understanding uh, than what I've got, but I, I do really believe this. Now I've seen this, that we are under attack. This was also mentioned earlier that Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He cannot devour every person. If Satan, if it was just up to him, every one of us in here would be in the process of, I mean, dying. We would be paralyzed. We would be poor. We would all be miserable. Satan goes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but he cannot have access to you without some cooperation on your part. And some of us are cooperating without even knowing it. It's not that you're out sinning, rebelling, hating God, but you know, as has already been mentioned, you just, you're in a fight. If you understood that Satan is going about as a roaring lion, I guarantee you, would, you wouldn't be goofing off and watching things that minister doubt and unbelief and fear to you and, and all kinds of lust and temptation and goofing off and doing the things that we're doing. We're living like, you know, there isn't a battle. We are in a battle. The kingdom of heaven is suffering violence. Satan is out to destroy every single person that he can. He would kill you in a heartbeat if, it, if you allow him to. You are in a battle. And who wins? The violent. The people who get violent. You have to get violent. You have to get, and this is what Daniel and Carly were illustrating up here with everything they were saying. It was hard for them to sit still. Man, they're worked up. They're angry. They hate sin. They hate sickness. You've got to hate sickness. You've got to hate sick. I hate, I, I hesitate to say this because it takes more explanation than what I'm wanting to give it. I'm, I'm doing some other things, but uh, I hate sickness as much as I hate adultery. You couldn't make me be sick any more than you could make me commit adultery. Amen. And, I, and there's some people sitting here that, well, I don't have any control over it. You do. You do. It's up to you. It's not up to Jesus. You know, some people... I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it has to be this way, but this is the way it seems to always be. God wants every single person healed. But you know what? There seems like there's always a few people who will leave and still be sick. It's not because God didn't will it. It's because we don't stir ourselves up. It's because we don't reach out and take what is rightfully ours. All of the failure is on our part. It's not God's part. If it was only up to Jesus, if Jesus didn't have to have our cooperation, well, then I can guarantee every single person who'd walk out of here totally healed and prosperous and full of joy and full of peace. But there's things in us that block the flow of God, that hinder it. And one of those things, there's many things, but one of them is if we are too passive. We aren't violent. We tolerate sickness. As long as you can tolerate being sick, you will. 
But when you get to a place to where I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, I refuse to be this way. I will not live this way any longer. And you get angry. I tell you, it, it just does something. Did you know God gave you the capacity to get ang angry? Most people right now think, oh no, that's totally the devil. I mean, when I get angry, it's all the devil. Well, the way that we use it might be of the devil, but every person that is in here, you have the capacity to get angry. It's a God-given trait. God gave us anger. Matter of fact, there are times where it says, be angry and sin not. Let me turn over and show you this out of Ephesians chapter four. It's a command to be angry. Ephesians chapter four and in verse uh, 26, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. There is a godly anger. There is a godly use of anger. Be angry and sin not and don't let the sun go down. Don't ever let it rest. Don't ever put it to bed. You got to keep yourself stirred up or you're going to sink to the bottom. You got to get angry. If you hated sickness as much as you hated going out and lying, stealing, murdering, doing something, and if you said, I will not be sick, I will not, I guarantee you, it would release something on the inside of you. You know, I remember one time that Jamie and I, back during our poverty days, which was self-inflicted, it was me, not Jamie, but I caused us to be poor, we were trying to sell a car. The Lord had told me that's how he was going to meet our need. And we were three weeks late. We, were, we hadn't eaten in two weeks. Uh, we were struggling. And anyway, I just reached a place where I couldn't stand it anymore. I had had all I could take. And I went down to our little church building. And I remember I started screaming and yelling. I lost my temper. Not at God. I knew God wasn't a problem. I got mad at the devil. I said, I don't know what the problem is, but I know you're involved and I just let him have it. <laughs> and I began to yell. I mean, I was yelling and screaming. I was beating my fence against the wall. If I could have got my hands on the devil, I would have done some damage. I was mad and I was rebuking the devil. And all of a sudden, I mean, just like that, I knew that our problem was solved. I didn't know how. But I just knew. I said, it's done. And I went home to tell Jamie. I said, it's done. Our car is sold. And before I could tell her that, she met me and she says, a guy just called. He's going to be at the church in five minutes. He saw the car there. He's got the cash. He wants to buy the car. And I didn't even get to tell her. <laughs> I had to turn around and go back. And this car was a dog. It was a 56 Bel Air, I think. And... Uh, anyway, it was supposed to be a nice car, but we had just run the wheels off of it. The U-joints were bad and that thing shook so bad that when you drove, it was just boom like this. And it, it had, a, the keys would come out of the ignition. You could pull the keys out and the car would still run. That's true. There wasn't anything wrong with it. That's the way they made it back then. And anyway, the thing would shake so bad and we had holes in the floorboard where you could see the pavement as you were driving by. And if you weren't careful, the thing would jerk so bad that the keys would come out and they could fall through the hole. And if you turned on the, uh, if you turned on the heater, it pumped water on your feet. And it burned a quart of oil every 50 miles. And I could mention other things. It was just... It was bad. And so anyway, this guy said, I'm here to, to buy the car. And I said, well, look, I got to tell you, I, I feel I obligate. I got to tell you all these things. So I told him everything that was wrong with it. And he says, I don't care. I want it. And I said, look, I'm not going to let you buy it unless you drive it around the block. So he got in, he drove it around the block. We took off in a huge cloud of smoke and he drove around the block and he came back and he says, could I buy it now? And I said, well, yeah. So anyway, I gave it to him, but uh, as, we, as we were exchanging the money and signing the title and stuff, he says, I saw this car three weeks ago when I had $500 on it. I'd come down to three fifty, dollars And he says, I told my wife, I says, that's my car. I'm going to buy that. And he says, for three and a half weeks, my wife has been fighting with me and saying the last thing we need is another junk car around here. He didn't want the car to drive. It was going to be for parts. 
He was just buying it and he was going to cannibalize it. And he already had a couple of cars around. And his wife says, we don't need another junk car. And she wouldn't let him have it. And anyway, they've been arguing about this for three and a half weeks. But while I was down at the church rebuking the devil and binding and saying, I've had all of this I can take. She just walked in. It was on a Saturday. He was watching a sports game on television. And she walked in and threw the money in his lap and says, go get your car. <laughs> so he called and came down and got it. And anyway... When I heard all of this, I thought, why did I wait three and a half weeks to get angry? <laughs> did you know that could have happened three and a half weeks before, but we tolerate, we put up with things. I'm telling you, God gave you a temper, not so that you could get mad at people, but so that you could be mad at the devil, so that you could be mad at sickness. Satan is stealing, killing and destroying. And we're sitting there saying, oh God, please do something. It's not time to be begging God. It's time for you to get up and take your authority and tell the devil where to go. Yeah. Amen. You need to be angry at the devil. And the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. It's not a passive word. It's active. Resist. Fight against the devil and he will flee from you. God is not in, con in uh, direct conflict with the devil. They already meant Jesus won. Satan is a defeated foe. The only power that he's got is deception and he's not fighting against God. He's fighting against you trying to get you to accept and receive these things. And when you get mad with the devil, he's at, at the heart, he is a coward. And he will run and flee every single time. But he's also desperate and he's been at this for thousands of years. And he knows if you really are standing with everything you've got or if you've got any quit in you. And if he can discern that he's got Quinn in you, he's so desperate that he will stand and fight through until you reach that place to where, you know, you're going to either go one way or the other. You're going to quit. He will push you. But once you make that decision and just, there is no plan B. There isn't a plan C. I have no alternative. I'm not trying this. This is just it. I'm healed. And when you get that determined and you get angry and start resisting him like that, he will tuck his tail and run every single time. He will flee from you, not from God. God's power is on the inside of you. So he says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Never let it go to bed. Never let it rest. You need to live with a constant agitation on the inside of you. Not at people, not at God, not at life, but just at the devil. Like Satan, I dare you. I dare you to come at me. I'm ready. You're just constantly on guard. You're constantly ready. You don't tolerate stuff like that. And yet most of us have been actually taught to embrace sickness and disease. You know, we recently interviewed Deborah McDermott. I don't know how many of you have seen the testimony of James and Timothy McDermott that were healed of autism over in the UK. It is a tremendous testimony. And as good as the video is that we put out of that, I interviewed Deborah. I was asking her more details and she gave me more details. And the health officials in the UK says, you need to embrace autism. You need to recognize that that is the way your children are. And if you don't make peace with autism, then you are hating your children because this is who they are. And when they said that, that just pushed her over the brink. Like, I'll never make peace with this. This is what's destroying my boys. And she got mad and she refused it. And I tell you, that was a huge part of her healing was just the fact that she had, she stood up and she was hating this thing. She wasn't making peace with it. And today her boys are just totally normal. I mean, her son, Timothy, went through two years of our school in the UK and I think he did two years here in the States and, and he was one of the most popular kids in our school living on his own. Before that, he couldn't even leave the house screaming, yelling, tormented with autism. And now he's just, it's amazing. He's, it's awesome. And the youngest one, James, I think will be coming to school next year and he'll be living on his own. God just set him free. 
And a big part of it is that they just got stirred up. Like I've had all of this that I'm going to have. You know why most people won't do that is because you fear that you don't have the power and the authority to do that. You fear that if you really got into a fight with the devil, he might win. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you have. I think one of the things that's going to happen when we get to heaven, you know, the scripture says he's going to wipe all tears away from our eyes. And some people think that's because we just limped into heaven that we suffered so much down here. We were all crying and barely made it inside the gates and he's got to wipe tears from our eyes. Well, there's going to be some of that, but I think a lot of it's going to be when we all of a sudden know all things as even as we are known and we realize that we had absolute authority and power and Satan had no power against us unless we cooperate with him. There's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth when we realize, oh God, I, I lived with this stuff all of these years and I didn't have to. Oh God, and there's going to be crying and wailing and God is going to have to comfort us when we realize that we just allowed the devil to steal, kill, and to destroy when it wasn't necessary. You don't have to get decrepit when you get old. You don't have to have all of these things happen. You do not have to go through all this. Some people say, well, then how are you going to die? You can just go to sleep, not wake up. You can be like Jesus. Nobody took Jesus' life from him. He was full of life. You could have, you could have crucified him a hundred times and it couldn't have killed him. He gave up the ghost. He said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. You don't have to die sick. You don't have to die with all of these problems. You can just go to be with the Lord. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, one of the problems is that we don't realize we're in a battle. We are passive. We're complacent. And we need to hate evil. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow as we continue bringing you highlights from Karis Bible College's 2018 Healing is Here Conference. Two young boys, one with Asperger's Syndrome, the other with autism. How does a family cope with what doctors tell them is a life sentence of torment and despair? Discover what happens when their parents choose to walk in the truth of God's Word. Take the Healing Journey with the McDermott Family. Healing Journeys Volume 4. Now available on DVD at awmi.net. Ministry is about you coming to the end of yourself but never losing that heart for people. I think we are in the midst of one of the greatest things that God has done. New things are being birthed. There's new joy. There's new life that is flowing out of them. And we're not going to quit. And we're not going to give up. And we're going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. You came here with some kind of a vision. Now what do you see? We're standing now on the fourth level of our parking garage. I know that there's a lot of noise going on, but man, this is construction. It's music to my ears. And we're just about a month away from being able to occupy this. So as you can see, there's a lot of open space right here. You can see where the ramp is here, how that you go down between the levels. We're facing right now, you are looking uh, west, but behind us on the very first level, we have our one entry down on the bottom level and that's where you enter. Over on the north side, we have an entry on the second level. And then over on the far west side, we have an entry on the third level. So we'll have three different entry points into this. And down on the second level, we have two entrances on the second level where you walk directly into our building. We also have another entrance on the third level that for security reasons will only be opened up to our CBC staff and our phone center people. So again, I've mentioned this before, but for maybe those of you that haven't heard, I did go into debt on this parking garage. I didn't plan on it, but it just happened. And we are believing to get this paid off just as quickly as we possibly can. So if you haven't yet become a part of this, I would really encourage you to do it. So God bless you, we'll give you another update in about a month and we should either be occupying this 
are right on the verge of occupying it by then. God bless you and thank you for being a part of this. I'd like to encourage you to get our Healing Is Here materials. We've got it in deep in CDs right here. We also have DVDs that were made at the conference, and we also have a USB here where you can get the entire conference on there. And I tell you, this was powerful. We saw lots of people healed. And the way that Daniel Amstutz and Carly Teradez ministered along with all of our other guests and Audrey Mack. It was just a powerful time. You won't want to miss it. Our healing is here either on CD, DVD, or USB. Today, you viewed a portion of the 2018 Healing is Here conference. This conference in its entirety is available on either a CD or DVD album or on a USB drive for a gift of $49 or more when you contact us. This valuable product includes 16 powerful teachings that will build your faith to receive your own healing and help you minister healing to others. Also available is the free God Wants You Well booklet. This booklet answers common questions about healing and includes a list of every time Jesus healed someone in the Bible. This valuable resource is available to you for a limited time, free of charge on our website at awmi.net. This offer is limited to one free booklet per household. You can order resources or become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download many free resources or call our helpline at 719-635-1111. If the lines are busy, remember, you can order ministry materials or become a Grace Partner 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awmi.net. If you'd like to write us, use the address on your screen. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. In the month of February, he'll be in Orlando and Oakland, Florida. In March, he'll be at the Sanctuary in Woodland Park, Colorado for the annual Karis Bible College Men's Advance with special guest Tony Dungy, NFL Hall of Fame and Super Bowl winning coach, and James Brown, Emmy Award winning broadcaster on the CBS and NFL networks. Also at the Sanctuary in March, Andrew will be hosting the Army Conference for Ministers. And in April, Andrew will be back at the Sanctuary in Woodland Park for the annual Karis Bible College Campus Days, and also to host the new musical, David, the King of Jerusalem. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net. Do you want to connect with like-minded believers? Then Karis Bible Studies is the place for you. Find a Bible study near you by visiting karisbiblestudies.net.